This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including James C. Smith, Miranda Janelle, and Justin Zellers. Coming up on DTNS, satellite text messaging comes to Android. And Shannon Morse and Nicole Lee join us from Las Vegas to talk about a smartwatch that makes you not tired and live streaming your oven. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 6th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the Las Vegas Convention Center, I'm Shannon Morse. Also from the LVCC, I'm Nicole Lee. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, my friend, CES uh, has two more days to go, <laughs> apparently. Uh, but this is the last day we'll be covering it. So let's get right into the quick hits. On Tuesday's episode of DTNS, Aya's Actar explained by Microsoft's response to the FTC lawsuit against the acquisition of Activision, Activision Blizzard was legally aggressive. That filing included five-point list claiming that the FTC did not have constitutional standing to bring the case. Microsoft has since amended its filing to remove those claims. The company's public affairs spokesperson, David Cuddy, told Axios, quote, We initially put all potential arguments on the table internally and should have dropped those defenses before we filed. Somebody missed an edit, is what that sounds like. Uh, Android Automotive is becoming the operating system for GM cars, meaning the whole car runs on Android. So to keep it clear, Android Auto is the interface you see in the dashboard screen and actually can run on whatever OS the car runs on. Android Automotive is the operating system for the entire car. And while it does support Android Auto, obviously, it also supports other things, including Apple's CarPlay. The Polestar 2 already runs Android Automotive, and General Motors announced it's going to be rolling it out to its brands, too, including Hummer, Chevy, GMC, Cadillac, and Buick. And Honda also plans to be using Android Automotive in the future as well. Three Arrows Capital filed for Chapter 15 bankruptcy on July 1st. Liquidators in the case subpoenaed the usual account information needed to proceed with bankruptcy liquidation. Apparently, the founders have not complied, so the liquidator got approval from courts in the U.S. and also Singapore to serve the subpoena on Twitter. The account 3AC liquidation at replied the co-founder Kyle Davies the following. Quote, JPEG copies of the subpoena are attached to this tweet by way of service. An unredacted copy of the subpoena was served via email and can be provided upon request. <laughs> I've heard people tweet you've been served, but never actually literally mean it. That's amazing. Uh, Rackspace says its internal investigation showed attackers gained access to personal data of 27 customers during a ransomware attack in December. Now, the attackers had access to PST files. Those are files usually used for archives of emails, calendar events, contacts, things from exchange accounts. But Rackspace says there's no evidence the threat actor actually viewed, obtained, misused, or disseminated any of the data from the PSTs. Despite what many local news outlets may be saying, Google Chrome will not stop working on your parents' computer this <laughs> month. However, what is true is that on January 10th, Google will release the final version of Chrome, that's Chrome 109, for Windows 7, 8, and 8.1. All of these versions are already unsupported by Microsoft, so the end of Google Chrome support, not really unexpected here, especially since it was originally planned to end in July of 2021, but then got extended because of the pandemic. Chrome 109 will continue to work, but will no longer receive security updates, so will be unsafe to continue to use. Yeah, so you should get it off anybody's computer parrots or, or or otherwise uh but but it won't just stop working it's just you, they, it shouldn't work you they shouldn't want to get it off <laughs> qualcomm announced snapdragon satellite snapdragon satellite is a service similar to apple's emergency sos but unlike the apple service snapdragon satellite is right up front offering full two-way texting, so you can do more than just emergency communication. The service will run on Iridium satellites. Uh, those use the one gigahertz L band. That's the same band as GPS and some mid-band service. Now, that's better than the Global Star because there's more satellites. Apple uses Global Star, Qualcomm's using Iridium, and that means 
Qualcomm can use existing phone antenna parts. You don't have to make new antenna parts. Uh, you won't have to add any new components either. It will just have to build support into the chip. Users will need to point the phone in the right direction to get service, but you may not have to like hold it up above your head. And the speeds will be slow. We're talking three to 10 seconds to send an average text. So you're not gonna get calls or media, just text messages. Uh, Sarah, how are we gonna get this into a phone? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Support will show up in phones in the second half of this year that use the Snapdragon Gen 2 system on a chip and X70 modem, along with a minimal additional radio support. At launch, it'll do just emergency texts for free. Then somebody would have to work with Qualcomm to set up a regular messaging service. And we can, you know, go around the horn on who we think that might be. Satellite providers like SpaceX, AST, and Link, that's Link with a Y, have all been working with cell phone carriers on similar programs that work with existing 5G phone radios as well. Yeah, so it, it sounds like we're going to have a lot of these kinds of services with a lot of different uh, capabilities. Uh, when we start seeing phones with this built in uh, in the latter part of the year, they shouldn't have to cost much more because it's just a little bit of, of, of radio work uh, in there. Who do we think might actually launch a full two-way text messaging service on this? Samsung is my first guess. Yeah, it's a good They one. already have such a strong partnership with Qualcomm with the higher generation SOCs. And given that they usually put in the newest Snapdragons in their technology, I feel like I feel like Samsung would be a one of the main ones. I but would be very surprised if they yeah. didn't do a partnership with they, them for this. They would have to not do Exynos on that model or yeah, right, not offer right. this service in places where they have True. Exynos. Yeah. Uh, I think Samsung has already said, uh, correct, I'm not entirely sure of this, but I think they already said they, they expect to see satellite ready phones from multiple OEMs. Mm. So that would probably include Qualcomm, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting, but mm -hmm. we'll see. Question for everybody, uh, and you know, I know we're not all using iPhones, but has anyone used Apple's emergency SOS function? I no, have not done no. the test where it's like, yeah, it worked. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. I wish something like this was available for Android phones because I'm not going to carry around another device to weigh me down when I'm going hiking in yeah. Colorado, and I would like to have something that connects me to people back in Denver Absolutely. in case something happens. Yeah, and peace having, of mind. Having Absolutely. an Android alternative is, is huge. Like, this is something that would actually make me consider buying a specific smartphone brand just because I go mm -hmm. outdoors so often. I do think, however, um, I don't think a lot of people know about these kinds of services like emergency SOS, so I think yeah. a lot... It needs to be marketed better. Yeah, it has to be know? advertised, marketed. Yeah. I imagine a special purpose, and, and, and Samsung would be a, still a good candidate for this, maybe Motorola too, uh, a special purpose phone that's like, this is the one that has the service. Now, somebody's got to launch the service because oh, it has to have more than just the emergency feature in it sure. to be marketable the way I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But but if let's say Samsung decides to launch a service. They're going to they're gonna pay to launch this service on Iridium. The key with Iridium is the Iridium satellites talk to each other. The Global Star satellites that Apple uses don't. So you can do like full two-way satellite text messaging with people around the world in a way you really can't with the Apple. So stars. cool. Yeah. Yep. You know, there are so many movies that have come out about people getting lost, lost. in the middle of the woods or like fall <laughs> from last year where the two girls get stuck on a tower. They, <laughs> they could have used this. <laughs> <laughs> This would that should be an ad. If <laughs> only we had two-way text support, we would get off of this well, building. You don't, you don't need the two-way text for the emergency. Don't, don't lose no, sight I, of that. I the two-way text is... Yeah, like, they just want to chat, you know, you, while they're waiting. you'll be able to do... Yeah, they're like, they're like so use selfie. the emergency stuff. Now we're bored waiting for the emergency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, you up? I'm on a building. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on Wednesday, Chalkbeat New York reported that the New York City Department of Education blocked access to OpenAI's chat GPT on its networks and devices. That's to prevent students from using it for cheating. Children can request access to the site if they have a legitimate reason. It's not completely blocked, but they have to have a good reason. Now, TechCrunch says OpenAI's spokesperson says the company is developing mitigations to help spot text generated by chat GPT hoping to work with educators on solutions to the problem, basically saying, okay, teachers, we know that this is an issue and we want to help you be able to spot when it's being used for, you know, instead of reading that 
long book. Yeah. So so this is the first school <laughs> system in the U.S. To, to put it on the filter list right next to Facebook uh, you, that you can't use it. It's similar to like you can't use a calculator on the test. And these days, I, I think I mentioned this before, now you can. They, they actually That's have right. tests where you're like, let them use the calculator. They We've adapted to the idea like, oh, but you can still test them in ways that the calculator is not going to cover for their knowledge. And I think right. that's what OpenAI is saying here is like, we want to help the educators get used to what chat GPT can and cannot do so that they, yeah, some of it may be looking for indicators, but some of it may just be like, oh, if you ask for these kinds of questions, chat GPT is never going to be able to answer that. So it's a, it's a way to test the direct knowledge of the student. Yeah. yeah chat GPT is definitely not perfect. There's plenty no, of times when it's like, not. like even content creators trying to write like a teleprompted script, they've noticed that factual information can be very incorrect with chat GPT. So even yeah. if kids are using this and like copying and pasting from their own home computer to turn in any kind of work, they they would still want to like check it and make yeah. sure it's factual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Also like like you know, there are AI detection software out there that I'm right. sure educators are using right now. It's just that and it's going to be one of those like cat and mouse race situations. It really will be. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, asking a student to create the answer right in front of you is just one way to make sure they're not using chat GPT. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, you want to be able to have them hand in papers and stuff that they work on their own time. Um, yeah. And you, and then using chat GPT as a tool, teaching them like, Hey, you chat GPT type things are good for this. Here's how to use them. Here's how to expand your knowledge by using them. I, I think that's important too. Yeah, I think I think to just say, oh, well, this isn't for classrooms because all the kids are going to do is going to cheat. Uh, it's it, That's not really the purpose of this. It's sort of similar to the calculator argument. It's like, well, if you have a calculator on a test and you're going to have a calculator in life afterwards, there's nothing really inherently wrong with using the calculator on a test because it's a tool that you have. Mm -hmm. You should understand what it's doing. It can do it maybe faster than your human brain can, can you know. I don't know, figure out a complex algorithm, but, uh, but chat GPT is, it's not bad for kids. It's just, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to have people cutting corners the way that you don't want kids to write book reports based on cliff notes either. Yeah, yeah no, that's a really, th this is cliff notes, cliff notes, you know, accelerated. <laughs> sort of yes. but, yeah. But yeah, it's a similar problem. <laughs> Uh, folks, don't miss out on a special audio interview uh, that Rich Straffolino recorded with CES spokesperson Tina Anthony. This Saturday, we'll be posting it up on Patreon. You don't have to be a patron to listen to it, though. Just head to patreon.com slash DTNS. That's coming out this Saturday. Well, every CES, there are way too many product announcements to cover. So we always try to bring you the ones that you're definitely going to hear about so that you can help understand those when you see the headlines or see them on your local TV uh, or the, the ones that we just think are notable, that, that they're going to help you understand things in the future. But there are always a few that don't quite make the cut each day. So once the early CES fury subsides, we try to take a second look. Here's a few of the off the beaten past CES things we want to tell you about before the week wraps up. Tuesday, we mentioned Stellantis's deal to make Archer's Midnight Flying Taxis. Another EV tall flying car made an appearance at CES, the Aska A5, A-S-K-A. It's a four-seat electric vehicle that can travel by road or air with a range of 250 miles by air on a charge. It can be charged on existing EV infrastructure, has range-extended engine, so you can put gas in it, regular car gas uh, you know, that you get down at the Shell station, uh, and it can take off and land vertically from a compact space. You don't need a runway, although it uses more energy to do that. So if you do have a 250 foot or less runway or more <laughs> runway, uh, you, you can get a little better energy efficiency. The FAA has accepted ASCA through their intake board. Full flight testing is starting after CES and ASCA is taking deposits for pre-orders with delivery in 2026. Now the retail price is, uh, is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's expected to be less than eight hundred thousand dollars. But how much less? Yeah, <laughs> like seven hundred sixty-eight thousand somewhere. Around oh, there. so oh. affordable. Well, that is fine. Not even a million dollars. The that's company also the plans to launch an on-demand ride service. That's probably where they're going to sell the majority of these is to, yeah. to fleets. Uh, and that ride service is expected to launch in twenty twenty-six. 
Kind of makes me wonder what gas stations are going to look like a few years from now. <laughs> I was about to say, when you say roll into a gas station, sure, this is going to roll into a gas or station. Or drop into a gas station from above. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that yeah. drop in right from before above. you get to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine being at a gas station and you see somebody like fly in from above and just drop straight down? <laughs> yeah, just take it. Inter- gas, I just ran out. I, like, I, I, th- <laughs> I think this is going to be something that we we're going to get used to sooner than later. But yeah, I, I think I think the, the ride service makes the most sense. Most most, mm-hmm. most consumers just aren't. This is this is a little. Uh, uh, I think you got your wallet's got to be pretty thick. I want to say Uber used to have someone with like a helicopter ride or something yeah, in New York they, or they something. They were partnering uh, on on a on a on a, hel- a helicopter service. Not an so. I guess it's kind of like exactly, that kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but this can also drive like a car, so it's not just a helicopter. I see. Well, speaking of the future of driving, Ford's F-150 Lightning EV truck is on sale. Chevy showed off its Silverado EV last year, which goes on sale next year. And Thursday, Ram finished the big three of truck makers to introduce EVs when it showed off its Ram 1500 Revolution BEV concept truck. It was a concept, so it has some cool stuff that you might see at CES, but it might not make it into production, like pillarless doors, cameras instead of rear view mirrors. But when it comes to market, uh, and Ram says it will, it will have a twin motor, all wheel drive layout, and the battery operates at 800 volts, which will allow the truck to DC fast charge at up to 350 kilowatts. We don't have any word on range, payload, or towing, not yet anyway, but there were lots of concepty things like touchscreens, interior lighting, party modes. Firmer details are going to come later. Ram says it plans to bring the car to market in 2024, whether you want to party in it or not. Party mode <laughs> in the truck. <laughs> yeah, we 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 finally got everybody into the truck. Remember, there was a couple of years ago we were talking to Tim Stevens on the show about like, yeah. hey, when are we getting electric uh, trucks? This is it, we, we have them. They're they're all yeah. on the way. They're, I guess we don't have them, but they're all in the pipeline. And I gotta say, I mean, I I, I I've, I've been very uh, excited about the uh, the electric F-150, not because I'm in the market for a truck, but just because at one point it was like, wow, look at Ford. They are really you know, pushing this whole uh, EV yeah. truck thing, and everybody else is getting on board. And the Ram is, I mean, it's huge. That's a really it's big giant. vehicle. It's, it's giant. Huge. I don't know that I would even be comfortable driving it, but I'm also not really hauling a lot of stuff in the back, and some people yeah, would yeah. love this. Uh, hey, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I would, pickup trucks are like a huge, huge, huge demographic in the mm-hmm. car automobile market. So top it's definitely, yeah, yeah, top seller. So this is definitely worth it. I'm excited to get one. And, and also the flying vehicle as well. Because it's flying totally trucks. in my price range. Oh, flying trucks. That's next year's CEO. <laughs> flying <laughs> trucks. Flying pickups. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Uh, this you just can't turn to <laughs> This next one is one that that I kept seeing and kept just not quite making the cut, Uh, but it's really cool. Citizen announced new CZ smartwatches that include a self-care advisor called UQ. So it's it's more about this app that only is available on the new generation of CZ smartwatch. Software was built with IBM Watson, and what it does is over a 7 to 10 day period, it learns what they call a chronotype. Uh, It uses sleep data as well as a score from an alert test adapted from NASA's psychomotor vigilance test or PVT test, uh, which they use to assess fatigue. So you have to take a brief gamified daily test. You have to wear the watch to bed. But if you do, the watch will recommend actions and activities to reduce fatigue. UQ only runs on the new second gen CZ watches. Those watches are decent watches. Uh, they run Wear OS. They have a gyroscope, altimeter, barometer, accelerometer, heart sensor, SPO2, ambient light sensor. Uh, and you can pre order them now, starting at $375 for delivery on March 1st. It's actually pretty nice. I wouldn't mind having a watch that can kind of figure out my fatigue cycle and tell me what I can do to fix it. Yeah. I think it's very useful. I mean, I would definitely like. I, mean, I feel like you know I have a I have an Apple Watch and it's it's useful for like you know counting steps and fitness and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But this adds an, this adds an, another layer to the whole like you know whether you're tired all day and and I certainly am <laughs> tired all day, so I might need this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there. 
I, I hesitate because it does sound like they actually worked with NASA and the PVT yeah. is a real test that is used in some critical situations like, you know, astronauts and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So so there's some definite science behind this. I'm not sure about the chronotype or how they match the sleep data with the right. PVT. The fact that it's a gamified PVT that's been adapted. It's not the full one. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious how accurate this is. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, if it helps, it helps. Right. Yeah. Well, everybody loves a smart kitchen, and Samsung showed off the bespoke AI oven with a 7-inch touch touch screen that can do air frying, steam cooking, has dual temperature zones, and something that Samsung is calling air sous vide. You can also use the company's SmartThings cooking platform to set timers and preheat things, using some computer vision to tell you what food you're putting in it and recommends time, temperature, mode of cooking, uh, whether it's broccoli or meat, for example. Supposedly, it can recommend 780 dishes and ingredients, uh, 106 in the EU. It can also detect things like burning, and EU models can warn you if your food is getting overcooked. Plus, you can use the camera inside to check on your food remotely, and you can even live stream it as it cooks. Maybe you do cooking videos. Maybe that would be something that would be kind of helpful uh, in real time. Coming to the EU and the U.S. in Q3 of this year, but no word on price yet. I'm curious what regulatory uh, differences caused the EU to get the overcooking warning and the United States <laughs> not. Uh, that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> we just, you know, we love well done meat. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. So, no. I should say that, um, <laughs> you know, as Samsung is calling it air sous vide, I th- Think, I don't think it's. I think that's a thing that exists already. Uh, like I, uh, Anova's precision oven, a lot of steam ovens. That's steam oven is sous vide ish, but like without but using the bag. But they're distinguishing it. They're saying it's steam cooking. There's steam cooking and there's air sous vide. So well, yeah, I'm not sure. What I don't that know. I'm a little either. bit yeah. skeptical on on that term. But uh, it's very interesting that you can attach it to like you can live stream your food. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my, yeah, I, know, I know everybody thinks that's crazy, but I think me and Sarah are like, oh, yeah, live streamers, like yeah. Twitch streaming, cooking <laughs> channels. There's so many places. It's not so yeah. many I think everybody thinks, oh, like, this. how interesting is that to just watch the turkey cook? But my guess is it's going to be you in front of the <laughs> camera the with the oven as an inset. Like, you know, <gasps> yeah, like watching, a picture in yeah. picture yeah. type thing. talking it's about gonna it an, as it It's going to be a yeah. new niche. Hear me out. Yep. ASMR cooking videos. Ooh. Okay, a little sizzle. There we go. A little sizzle. The sizzle. The yeah. sizzle of How good's the, the mic? Chicken. No one's asked that. How good is the yeah. mic on the bespoke AI oven? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the June oven, which I uh, reviewed for a Live With It segment in 2020, uh, it does also have a camera, um, which I've I've used within the app to be like, oh yeah, look, there's there's my asparagus cooking, um, which you could you could then take that video and put it somewhere, but it's not a live stream capability. It would take a little mm-hmm. bit of work on your part, mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, I think this this goes a step further. And hey, people will live stream pretty much anything, and cooking videos are pretty popular because we all like to eat. Billy Gates Manchog in our chat is like, wait, doesn't sous vide mean under vacuum? But how do you yeah, have exactly. air? In a, That's why. Anyway, I'm, yeah, we're still stuck on that. On. All right. Uh, Eve Systems announced that it's Eve Door and Window, Eve Energy, and Eve Motion sensors. So, you know, d- plugs, door sensors, stuff like that. Uh, the ones that are coming out in March will have Matter support out of the box instead of you having to do a firmware update. Uh, Eve's already ahead of the game on Matter with all products in its lineup except the light strip and flare eligible for Matter upgrades. But now you won't even have to do an upgrade. It'll just be matter support out of the box. Eve also announced a kit to turn any basic roller blind into Eve motion blinds. You don't need to do any special wiring. You don't need any special tools. You just add it to the blinds you have. And then you can control the automation in HomeKit. Although... When Matter, the platform, adds blinds to the standard later this year, it will work because it's thread compliant out of the box. It will work with all Matter systems as well. So you won't be stuck in the HomeKit app after that. Uh, that one's coming March 28th for 200 bucks. I love this. I'm really excited about that. I'm, I'm excited just in particular about companies, including Eve Systems, putting Matter into their products and making it really easily accessible for consumers. Yeah. Yeah. That's been one of the big trends out of CES is, is it's matter compliant, which usually it makes me roll my eyes when they're, Oh, everybody's, but this time it's important. It's like, Oh good. Yes. Thankfully. It's yes, matter compliant. it is. Yeah, yeah. And it's nice to know that, you know, this is already integrated into their products. So people don't necessarily have to deal with a bunch of upgrades or anything, mm-hmm. or if they do, 
um, they also mention the eligibility. So that's pretty cool too. I think it's well, great. Yeah, motion motion blinds would be very useful for sure. Well, uh, if you want something that's also potentially great, EcoFlow launched its whole home backup power solution, coming in three versions, although it's really only two. The starter kit is just the existing Delta Pro power station. So if you have a power inlet box and a transfer switch, you buy a, a 30A cable, you plug it in, it costs $3,699. The advance kit takes two Delta Pro power stations, connects them with a double voltage hub for 7,200 watts of output. That costs $7,498. You can pay extra to make it four batteries or even six. That should be able to power your home for about a week, uh, you know, depending on where you live and what you're doing. Then there's the smart control kit, which adds an EcoFlow smart home panel that can handle automatic switchover during a power outage. It can also schedule circuits to cut over battery power at peak times, so you're cutting down on your bill. EcoFlow whole home package kits are available now in the U.S. and qualify for a 30% tax credit and are coming to Europe soon. These are interesting because at least those first two kits don't require an electrician. And even the one that does, the smart control kit, uh, has some, some nice smarts in it for the price. They're not necessarily a lot cheaper than mm -hmm. what you would get from other companies. Uh, mm -hmm. But EcoFlow is great. I have, I have an EcoFlow uh, Delta that I use as, as, as my backup you know, in case of power outage. And, and they make really good stuff. So this is trying to make that whole home backup just a little bit easier to install. This is a big trend that I've also seen at CES with several different companies is making power backup solutions a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. They are still relatively expensive for most folks, but you are seeing a lot of different options, a lot of different models for a variety of consumers, whether you just need something as a battery backup or you need a true and powerful generator, or if you need something that you can actually put into your your home system to back up your entire household. So there's there's a lot coming out right now that has to do with backup power solutions and this is one of them so i'm excited to see it i'm really really enjoying the competitive market that we're starting to see having had a power outage literally two days ago mm. in, <laughs> in san francisco due to the, the the big storms i would have loved a backup yeah. power solution totally yeah and and it and it can save you uh money on your bill too uh, oh, if, absolutely. You, if you're able absolutely. to have it charged during uh during off peak and then provide power during peak so that you're not paying the, the peak rates uh yeah there's some good stuff there uh, EcoFlow also announced three home products. The Glacier is a fridge and freezer that can make 18 ice cubes in 12 minutes. Uh, <laughs> battery can power the device for 24 hours on a single charge, and it can hook up to solar, so you can kind of keep, keep it going. It's available in April. Blade is a robot lawnmower, not vampire, robot lawnmower that can also <laughs> collect leaves. So it can, it can suck the leaves off your lawn, uh, not the blood. It supports virtual boundaries, route planning, and obstacle avoidance and includes 4G-based anti-theft protection. So you can disable it if it gets stolen. It's also coming in April. And the Wave 2 is the new battery-powered air conditioner, which also can be used as a heater. Runs eight mm. hours off the removable battery and will be available in May. The air conditioner made a big deal when it came out. Now it can do both. Uh, no problem. Prices, though, on any of these yet. Mm -hmm. I want to use all of these in my house. I would love a battery powered <laughs> air conditioner. The lawnmower <laughs> looks pretty cool. I yeah. mean, I, I, I want one of those straight up because my husband, it's so hard to talk him into actually using the lawnmower. <laughs> so I could just be like, well, just turn on the robot. I think you still need to be out there looking it over, but still better than pushing Watching it, it around, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 It. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's fine. He could sit out there and, I don't know, talk on the phone. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't. I I love my my Roomba. Uh, I I could not live without it. In fact, so something that is sort of like this for the outdoors. And yeah, you'd have to you'd have to be supervising it on some level. Yeah. Well, I, we have a lot of leaves. You know, it's like well, we, maybe we wouldn't have to pay landscapers to come and clean up all the leaves every two weeks if the ro has, if the robot did its thing. I love that he has anti theft protection just in case someone just takes it. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> you because you walked inside to get a lemonade or something, and then somebody yeah. came in and grabbed it. Hey, yeah. where's my blade? <laughs> uh, we we got two more to get to. Let's let's get to it. What's next, Sarah? Yeah. 
All right. Cyber Power PC showed off a concept for a new cu- custom full-size keyboard configurator, similar to its extensive configuration offerings for its PC products. Might be familiar with the uh, Cyber Power line. This will provide different plate and keycap and switch and cable options. It eventually hopes to provide 65% and 10 keyless options as well. We don't have a release date yet, but I know some mechanical keyboard fans will be excited about this one. Yeah, Rich Straffolino uh, recommended we talk about this today. He, he's, he's into mechanical keyboard. Boards and he's, he was like, this is just a great entry level one or or easy one, even if you're not entry level, if you just want to have a, an easy way to do some customization. It's beautiful. It looks great. And and mechanical keyboards are, are the thing these days. And it's actually relatively inexpensive. Uh, then there's the Satechi GAN charging hub that can deliver 200 watts of power across six USB-C PD ports, two of which support USB-C 3.1. So they can do laptop level power. Weighs just over a pound is 4.1 by 4.1 by 1.4 inches. Uh, so it's pretty slim. The watts are distributed among the ports depending on how many you've got plugged in. So if you just plug in your MacBook Pro, you can charge 140 watts. Uh, but the more you plug in, the more distributed it gets uh satechi's 200 watt six port pd gan charger coming in q2 for 150 bucks that's a pretty good price for um for a lot of peace of mind when you've got a variety of gadgets that need to not go off the grid a lot of power in a backpack you could just yeah Yeah. it's only less than a pound just over a pound i guess yeah Yeah. you know it, it i mean it's not that big either this thing is really nice and so powerful. And fast charger because it's GAN. So it's going to yeah. charge you mm-hmm. up real fast. I love real GAN. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's check out the mailbag, Sarah. We got one from Russell. Russell had feedback on Roger's latest column about AMD's new CPUs and GPUs. Roger was lamenting the disappearance of the sub $200 gaming GPU. Mm. And in response to Russell's suggestion, Roger might consider a game streaming service. uh, Russell says to Roger and the rest of us, doing video editing, great use case. But then the card is for work, not strictly gaming. For serious gamers that don't want to spend the money on PC GPUs, there is the option of consoles that are less than the cost of most cards. However, hopefully, as the current GPU cycle becomes more commonplace, better GPU yields and competition will bring the prices back down. Yeah, go check that out. Uh, Roger's column is really good at patreon.com slash DTNS. Thank you, Russell. Uh, Also, Charles wrote in about that $3,500 baby stroller we talked about yesterday. Uh, He said, it seems very expensive until you compare it to e-bikes. $3,500 $3,500 for an e-bike is not that outrageous. There are e-bikes that are in the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. Love the show. Y'all rock, Charles. Oh, thanks, Charles. Yeah. It still yeah. doesn't allow me to pay for it, but it does <laughs> It does make it seem less expensive when you compare it. What to about it. flying baby strollers? Yes. <laughs> Along with just, trucks. Just, just think about it. Flying yeah. baby trucks. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, hey. babies who drive flying trucks. Autonomous yeah. trucks that can fly your baby that around safely. That can fly your baby. Oh, this got Boom. weird. Yeah. Done. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I know. It did, it did get weird, but it might it might be reality uh, sooner than later. Uh, thanks to Shannon Morris and Nicole Lee for being with us today. Shannon, where can people keep up with your work? I would say check out YouTube.com slash Shannon Morris. I have been posting YouTube shorts. I don't know how to do shorts. I'm learning, so please bear with me. But (laughs) I'm I'm posting a bunch of shorts from CES, and I hope you enjoy them. Well, I'm sure people will. Uh, Nicole Lee, you've got some new stuff uh, coming down the pike. Let folks know where they can get up with that. Um, I just started a newsletter like a few days ago. Um, It's on Button Down, so the URL is buttondown.email slash Nicole Lee. Um, I'm calling it the Fringe Dispatch as a little Mm. homage to my favorite movie, Fringe Dispatch. Um, But it's going to be about fringy tech stuff that I find interesting, and uh, I'll probably will start with some stuff I found at CS. So check it out. Very cool. We're glad to have both of you here and hope that you, uh, your, the rest of your time at CES keeps you safe and healthy. Uh, thanks to our brand new boss, Sean. Sean just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Sean. Big gold star to you. We weren't sure if we would have someone to make CES coverage possible for one more day, and Sean stepped up. Well done. Sean stepped Sean. up. Yeah. Very and, and all good. the other patrons, of course. But yeah, Sean put us over the edge. Speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. What will we talk about today? You can also catch this show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. We're back on Monday with Lamar Wilson joining us. Talk to you then. 
This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. CES correspondent and producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. CES field producer and technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W.S. Goddess One. BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributions for this week's show came from Ayaz Akhtar, Shannon Morse, and Nicole Lee. Guests on this week's show were Sherlyn Lowe. And thanks to all our patrons who made the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>